Hi guys, it's MJ, and in this video, we're going to be talking about securitization. So previous video, we looked at interest rate derivatives, which were quite complicated and difficult to price. Um, now we're going to be looking at something known as securitization. Now securitization, I think it's one of the greatest financial inventions ever made. Remember, this is me studying out loud. Videos are unedited, very much opinion based. So, you know, rather consult a textbook if you want just facts. But I'm going to go on record at saying that securitization is a fascinating inv um, invention and is very good for the financial markets. I'm actually got a paper pending um, on securitization and the blockchain, and I'll maybe discuss that a little bit. But I just want to say securitization is a good thing. Okay, it's a good thing. I know it kind of caused the world recession and almost wiped out the you know the world's economy and you know financial uh, Armageddon, but that's because people you know abused it and that that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, how it was working is banks would sell houses to people who had no income, uh, no jobs, no assets, otherwise known as ninjas, uh, no income, no job, and no assets. Um, so they sold these houses to these ninjas, and what they would do is they would take these bonds, securitize them, chop them up into nice little tranches, uh, get a credit rating agency who are, we don't like credit rating agencies, they're bad, uh, confuse them with some really fancy mathematics and, you know, copulas, two-dimensional uh, distributions, ooh, so they got a triple A rating and were able to sell these to big pension funds um, around the world, which then gave them enough money to purchase more houses to give to more ninjas, and it was this terrible cycle that went in on each other. Some smart individuals bought things known as credit, um, what are they known, credit derivative swaps? Uh, are they called credit derivative swaps? Yeah, sorry, credit default swaps. Uh, credit default swaps, and these guys then took a bet against this, and they invented this instrument because they saw that this uh, financial system was unsustainable, and they made a lot of money from it. That's from that movie, um, The Long Short, or The Short Long, I don't know, that movie, that Steve Corral's in. Um, we're going to be talking about credit default swaps a lot tomorrow, so tune in for that video, um, and more about, say, the credit um, crunch and the world recession. But just know that securitization was used and abused in this instance, which is unfortunate because it's now got a bad name and it's actually a brilliant invention. What does securitization do? Well, that's going to be the point of this video. And the great thing about securitization is that it provides business owners or just people in the economy with an alternative form of raising capital other than loans or equity. Remember, loans, you get some money from a bank, and if you fail to make the repayment, they come and they take your assets away, and it's a traumatic experience. Equity is you give some control over to an investor. Uh, you have to give him a dividend in forever, as long as the business is alive, which kind of sucks, and you're giving him some control. So if he doesn't like the way you're managing it, he can call the other directors together and they can vote you out of your managerial position. So both loans and equity have got these disadvantages. Securitization provides a way, an alternative way that doesn't have uh, these downsides. It doesn't give over control. It doesn't give over control and doesn't need collateral. Okay, very, very important. So how does securitization work then? Well, let me explain. What you do is, with securitization, let's say you have a business or you have any sort of income stream. Okay, you've got an income stream either from selling beer, selling chocolate, um, getting fees from a service, it could be a hairdresser, anything can be securitized, as long as it's got this income stream. And then what you say is, we're going to be, let's say, getting a hundred rand every day. Okay, now what we could do is, and let's say we are a hairdresser, okay, hairdresser with our little saloon. If we took a loan and we didn't make the hundred rand every day, 
the saloon would, uh, bank would take away the saloon. If we sold equity shares, then they might, you know, kick us out as management. We'd still hold the percentage that we already have, but we won't be able to be, say, the lead hairdresser or something like that. What securitization does, it says, what we're going to do is we're going to take this 100 rand every day, this revenue stream, and we are going to crystallize it. In a sense, what we're going to do is we're going to take this 100 rand every day, 100 rand every day, and we're almost going to form a security or a bond, hence the name securitization. We're going to turn it into a bond, sell it off to an investor, and get cash up front. So I'm going to trade my income stream for a lump sum payment. Now as a hairdresser, I might want to do that because now I can build another salon, I can get another fancy scissors, or I don't know, get some assets, or I can just, I don't know, there's lots of different reasons why you'd want a lump sum payment. Uh, what's also cool about securitization, it doesn't have to be the full amount. I mean, you could just say 50 Rand of the 100. So 50% goes. And that's quite a nice way for a hairdresser to, to realize their wealth uh, without diluting ownership in their own business. Now, why would an investor be interested in a securitization compared to, say, a loan or an equity? Well, this is why investors like it, because it offers a big diversification benefit. Because what you're basically doing is you're getting pure exposure to the revenue model, to how, how many people are cutting their hair. With equity, what first has to happen is you're getting exposure also to the operating um, risks of the business. Because you take that revenue, you take away uh, expenses, you take away tax, you take away all those other things, and then you only get your dividend. With securitization, you get your payment straight away. It's at the top of the revenue. So that's a benefit for, for investors. Also, the duration can be tailored. So what you can do is you can say, is Taylor spelled like that or is it spelled like that? I don't know. Uh, I think it's, anyway, that's not important. Uh, important thing is that the duration be, can be tailored. So securitization can be for five years, three years, one year, which is great for when it comes to, say, matching your assets versus liabilities, which we'll look at later in asset liability uh, modeling. Now, so securitization, yeah, it has these diversification benefits and it has this duration. It does have the weakness in the sense that it's maybe not as liquid, it's not as marketable as um, shares or loans. So that does need to be considered, but that also depends on various other, other factors. Um, so what, but anyway, let's get uh, back to, sorry, my, my mind's jumping all over the place. I'm very excited about talking. I'm very excited to be talking about securitization. Um, Let's get back into some of the theory. So what was, what is securitization mainly used for? It's mainly used for mortgages. Um, and it's also used for credit card repayments. The reason being is that these things are massive. And securitization does require a lot of admin, a lot of auditing, a lot of certification, um, you know, trust that they actually are, there's a lot of um, yeah, trust required, um, auditing, and a lot of expenses to set it up. Hence why it is only mainly used for very big um, deals such as mortgages or credit card repayments, where we're talking, you know, billions of dollars compared to, say, a hairdressing salon, which is might not even worth $100,000. However, new technology, more preferably the blockchain, can change all of that. Blockchain can reduce the administrative burden of issuing securities while incorporating the same level of trust that an administrative uh, procedure would give. And that's actually something I've written about. Hopefully it will be published soon and yeah, I'll provide a link or just yeah, look out for that, that little document of mine. Maybe it will win the, the Nobel Prize in economics, no, I'm joking. Uh, but blockchain is a big technology that can help um, securitization be accessible to the general public 
and can be a great way of unlocking a whole bunch of capital. Anyway, for the test or for the exams, we need to look at um, securitization, the way it's applied to mortgages and credit card repayments and maybe a few other scenarios. The two things that we are very much interested in when it comes to securitization, it is predictability and sustainability. Okay, with our hairdresser example, we kind of made that 100 Rand uh, fix and we made it forever. So we made, basically simplified both of these um, dimensions for in order to explain the concept, but these are important. Predictable, is it gonna be a 100 Rand all the time or is it gonna be 99, is it gonna be 88? Technically what we would do is we would securitize say 50%. So we would say you're getting 50, 50, 50, 50 and it would be fixed. The predictability is, is important though, is whether you'll be able to pay it. So you might get 198, uh, 88, but if this goes to say below 45, then there's gonna be a default. So you de do need to be able to predict it to make sure that your default risk is low or to make sure that the coupons that you're paying out on your securitization is enough um, or can be met. The other thing is, and this is where actuaries can actually add a lot of value, yay for actuaries, is in sustainability. And this is something that you don't really get taught in other financial courses, and that is that income streams die. Okay, Income streams, just like how a stream in the real world dries up, um, so financial streams dry up. They dry up and they die. And this is where we can use our actuarial techniques where we look at, you know, say mortality, um, we can look at what is the probability that an income stream dies, that it, you know, degenerates and all these various things. So actuaries do have an advantage in this area. Okay, what can cause an income stream to dry up? Well, it could be competition, um, which depends on, say, barrier to entry. But it, a lot of the time it also comes down to, say, demand. Maybe people don't want to get their hair cut anymore, or maybe supply gets altered in the sense that more hairdressers are setting up, and if there isn't, say, a license to cut hair, then that's a very low barrier to entry, uh, so forth, so forth like that. But, I mean, you could spend an entire video or an entire textbook on trying to determine the sustainability of an income stream, and it will vary for every single one, and hence why that does actually add to the cost of setting up a securitization or at least in evaluating it. So predictability and sustainability. Um, I mean, so when you're looking at say the mortgages, you will look at say the lease terms, the rental prospects. Uh, with credit cards, you will maybe look at what is the current default, what is market confidence, look at all those type of things. Um, I mean, another thing you can get quite te technical into, like the structuring and security issuance, treasury management, probability of default, is there any chance of recovery, uh, the statistics of early repayment, all those various things. But I just want to talk about one last thing uh, that's mentioned in the notes, and it says that a major difficulty in securitization, and I don't think it's a difficulty at all, I think the notes are being really dumb here, but they say in the choice of the discount rate choice of discount rate. Okay, now the reason why I think that is dumb is because what we get told in the textbook is that risk can either be interpreted as reducing the cash flow. So they say there's a hundred rand every day, but there's a 95% chance that that might not be paid. Then instead of saying a hundred, we say 95. Okay, that's the smart way to deal with risk. The dumb way to deal with risk, which the textbook also gives, is to increase the interest rate. And that's dumb. So the idea is that if it's certain to get 100 Rand every single day, it would be, say, at 5%. Um, but if there's a 95% chance it will be repaid, rather use another interest rate. What interest rate? Maybe 6%, maybe 7%, depending on the duration and all these other things it's quite difficult to calculate what that percentage should be. Another reason why this is dumb 
is because when I want to analyze two projects and I'm seeing the one at you know 7% interest rate and the other one's at an 8% interest rate, it's very difficult to try and comprehend, well, how much risk is in that one percentage difference? And say, if we had to look from 1% to 2%, does that mean it's double the risk? Or is that the same amount of risk being added at, say, 8% to 9%? You know, they both got the difference of 1%, but is it an absolute or is it relative? I mean, interest rates are, ah, they're bad. So I don't see this as a problem because I see it as set your interest rate the same for every single asset which you're valuing and rather reduce the cash flow or express your risk in the cash flow amounts rather than fiddling with the interest rates which like I said on a, they are made up so the central bank could change it the next day and um, then you have to redo all your calculations whereas with this one you're just changing one amount because you've expressed the risk in the in the cash flows rather than the interest rate so I don't see that as a problem they do make a big fuss of it in the notes so you could probably get a mark by mentioning that in the exam but just know that there is a better way of doing it you can maybe even get another mark for for saying why it's dumb uh, that'll impress the examiners anyway that is the end of my video on securitization I'm very excited about this topic uh, I do a little bit more research into it so I do apologize if I was a little bit you know blabbering and stuttering as I try to contain myself talking about the subject, it's much better when I write about it than just talk about it because there's so much to mention and I seem to jump all over the place. So I do apologize for that. Um, tomorrow's video will be better. Tomorrow's video is on credit default swaps and it's fascinating because they're not actually swaps. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe let's talk about it more in tomorrow's video, but it's going to be quite interesting. So hope you tune in for that and otherwise thanks for watching. Cheers, guys.